with me to John chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 26. We're just going to read two verses here. John chapter 5, verse 26. And remember, this, this training is to get you started and to get the things out of your way that can get you started. It is not intended, or nor could it be in three days, a complete, total, exhaustive teaching on everything about healing. All right? So, <clears throat> we have to do some follow-ups and things like that usually to come in. And, and uh, usually we try to come back after about three months or so, or three, three to six months. By then, you've been doing it. You've got questions. You've got different things. What about this? And things you ran into. And then, so, then we can follow up. And the follow-up is usually mainly question and answer. Okay? So, that's kind of how we do it. But it, it, this, this uh, training is not really meant to answer all your questions because we don't have time. <clears throat> if I could schedule a couple of weeks here, then we could probably get to them. But as it is, we've got to work with what we've got. So John chapter 5, verse 26 says, For as the Father hath life in, him, in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because he is the son of man. Now notice, he had, he says that God gave him the ability to execute judgment because he was the son of man, not because he was the son of God. You hear that? Now anytime Jesus used the term son of man, he was referring to his humanity, not to his divinity. There's a difference between the two. So, now we're going to look at something here today when we get into healing and the atonement, which will be probably a session or two that we're going to look at this judgment. The reason I said this is because I want you to understand when we think of judgment, when we hear the word judgment, we always think of something bad happening. Okay, that's not just the judgment of God. God has given judgment where things, bad things have happened, especially in the Old Testament. But you don't see it in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, when Jesus healed someone, he was executing judgment. You understand? All, if you go to court, you have two people, you know, two <coughs> combatants, okay, two participants. The judge has to judge and rule a judgment, and when he gives his judgment, if you ask them, one's going to say, that was a good judgment. The other one's going to say, that was a bad judgment, right? It's depending on where you're sitting. Now, <coughs> We tend to think in terms of the bad judgment, you know. I was in one place and, well, I've been a lot of places, and people tried to say different things, you know. Katrina was God's judgment against New Orleans, right? That's not true. Okay, there's several reasons for that. Number one, when God judged a city, it disappeared, right? It didn't keep running in the middle of his judgment. And it didn't come back later, you know, to be a great city. And it, it's funny... According to most people's theology, for some reason, or their belief system, God can only hit cities on the coast. His arm is too short to reach in to hit Las Vegas. You see, it's just ridiculous how we think. And, and, and if God can only hit cities on the coast, why is San Francisco still standing? You know, he can't reach around the edge. He can only hit in the Gulf. You see, it's just, the way people think is just ridiculous, right? Do you know, just to let you know, <clears throat> the Bible says not to call anybody a fool, Right? But did you know that the word idiot is a medical term? Yep, you look it up. The word idiot is a medical term. So the Bible says not to call anybody a fool. It doesn't say anything about calling them an idiot. <laughs> right? Call them an idiot. It's a medical term. Right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> I went to this one place. It was a Bible school actually and taught. And basically said any minister that stands up and says that Katrina or some catastrophe like that is a judgment of God should resign and shouldn't be ministering because they're too stupid to represent God. So I <clears throat> found out later it had just been preached that Sunday from the pulpit. <laughs> so that's why I don't ask anybody when I come into a place. I don't talk to them about what's going on there. I don't want to know. I want God to be able to speak through me. And if, it, if he says something, it, I don't know anything that's going on. I don't ever ask anybody. So if I say something and it hits, it's God. It ain't me because I don't know. Simple as that. All right? So 
Um, <clears throat> but we need to realize our job is to execute judgment. Now, once we get into this, once you really start to see who you are and the position that God has given you, things start to change drastically. You know, it's like we were just talking back in the book room that when a policeman goes through police academy, they cannot teach them all 30,000 laws on the book. Can't teach them. The first, one of the first things they tell policemen is, as you drive, you be alert. You look. If it doesn't look right, it probably isn't. They tell them, go by your gut. That's why most criminals are caught more by instinct than by investigation. Right? Weird things. Almost, almost all the crooks, the gangsters in times past and all that were either killed or captured because of a gut feeling some policeman had that decided to check this person out. Almost every time. It's, it's amazing how that is. Now, you see CSI and you see all the forensics and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's good long range and on cold cases and stuff, but honestly, most stuff would be termed uh, solved by accident more than by investigation a lot of times. So, and I'm not putting down the investigation end of it because it's important. But I'm just saying, a policeman, a lot of times a policeman will pull over a car not because of what he can find wrong with it. What he finds wrong is the excuse he uses because the car doesn't feel right to him. Right? Now, personally, even if the man, even if the policeman is not a Christian, the Bible says that those that wield the sword are ministers of God. That's what it says in Romans. And that, that they are uh, commissioned, so to speak, by God to keep the peace. And I do believe that the Spirit of God helps policemen, even unborn again policemen, to help catch people. Uh, since we started a network and working with people, uh, <clears throat> so far, every situation we've gotten a hold of, we in, immediately begin praying and commanding this child to be found, them not to be hurt, this thing to be remedied, and different things, uh, you know, child abductions, things like that. And once we put that out through our network, everybody gets together. We start agreeing. We're not praying. We're agreeing and commanding. <clears throat> and I think so far, to my knowledge, all but one has been returned safely. And, it, and usually the policemen catch the person and find this child almost by accident, as you would think it. But I believe it's the Spirit of God that leads them. Right? I believe that, according to the Bible, we are to have dominion over this earth. We are to have dominion over our areas of influence. And I think that as we start working together and taking that dominion, that we're going to start seeing different things start happening uh, much more common. Okay? We also, <clears throat> on our new website, we're, we're putting together a new website. Should be up before too long. We're going to have uh, some areas in there when it comes up. It will not have these right away, but we're mainly getting the website up, and then we're going to start adding these other departments into it. But we're going to have an area for weather, that whenever a bad weather report comes up, you know, hurricanes coming in. We're going to put that on our website, send it out in the email. All of our people are going to start going against it, and we're going to stop this kind of stuff from happening. Right? My mom's done that all my life. You know, I'd like to say I figured it out. I didn't. I saw my mom do it. Then I went in the Bible and found out we can do that. And I can give you stories. And by the way, God likes to do things for his kids, not just because it's some dire emergency. He likes to do things just because his kids ask him. We, we were going to San Antonio. I, I like uh, <clears throat> the San Antonio, San Antonio area because of the history and the missions. And they got like seven or eight missions. And you can go on a mission trail and just drive from one to the other. And the, of course, the Alamo was one of them. And then there's several others along that were built. Some of them even back in the 1500s. And you can walk through them and all that. So about <clears throat> once or twice a year when I get a break or take a break, I will uh, we'll just drive down there and re relax for a couple of days and... I'll wander through the missions and take pictures and, you know, same pictures I took last time I was there, but it's always, yeah, I still take pictures. And so we go through them. And one, one year we were going down, it says me and my wife and my, both my daughters, I think it was. Yep. I think it was both my daughters. And so <clears throat> we were driving down and the, I, so I don't think about weather necessarily. So we're going down to take a vacation and come to find out on the way down, they had been flooding for like the last three weeks. And so there, I mean, it's flooded, everywhere's flooded, everything's flooded, and we're about, we're about six hours from there in Dallas. 
So we start driving down and it's still raining down there. And so as we head into it, it starts getting dark and the clouds are there and it starts raining and different things. And we're going along and <clears throat> my daughter looks up and says, Dad, this, this isn't going to be too good a vacation with rain and storms and all that kind of stuff. And so we're just driving along and I, she said that. So I just said, Father, you heard her. That's her request. Thank you. In Jesus' name. The weather clear. <clears throat> I said, all right. Took care of it. It'll be okay. So we're driving on. We pull into a Walmart. I think we had to go and get some stuff. Come back. By the time we come out, blue skies. I mean, it changed within a matter of about 30 minutes. All right? People say, you think you actually had something to do with that? Yeah, if I didn't, I wouldn't pray. If you don't believe God answers your prayers, why pray? People say, you think he did that just because you're going out? Yeah, why not? He needed somebody to pray. They'd had enough rain. They didn't need any more. He's just waiting for somebody to do it. And so we go on down. We, we get down there. And it's still kind of uh, cloudy over San Antonio. And she said, well, you know, it's really not pretty down here. And it's uh, all this. And I said, now look. I said, you know Texas. It's been raining. If the clouds go away and it's sunny skies, it's going to get hot and muggy. It's going to be humid because of all the rain. And I said, don't, don't even be griping when it gets like that. And she said, I won't, I won't. I said, okay. So, Father, clear up San Antonio, please. We need clear weather. So we go on. We get down the river walk, walk along, clouds open up, blue skies, it's beautiful. We're walking along, and all of a sudden she's, I look back, and she's walking like this. Like this. I look at her, and she goes, Dad, I said, don't even go there, I already told you, don't, don't even go there, don't. I said, you're starting to be like the Israelites, complain about manna, and God gives you manna, he gives you everything you ask, and you start complaining about it. I said, don't even, don't even do that. <clears throat> so we kept walking along, and within about an hour or so, it started clearing up even more so to where it didn't even feel human anymore. And so, but we, we've seen that. The first time we, we had a, um, well, not the first time we did a DHT, but we were in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And I got snowed in, and everybody got snowed out. And so we had to cancel a meeting. And so I decided right then, this will never happen again. And so from, at that time, we started looking ahead, looking at the weather forecast, and started saying, in the name of Jesus, that ain't going to be that way. And so we want clear weather, because... In this area, you need clear weather for people to come. If it rains, people stay home. And when I go to Florida or California, I've got to pray for rain. Because if it's pretty, everybody goes to the beach. So you can't have pretty weather. All right? So you've got to have bad weather for people to come to church. So, so, so good weather doesn't always mean pretty weather. Okay? But um, then after a while, now, now listen, because at first we prayed. Then we started commanding. Then we went on and actually quit I just started expecting it. Didn't even say anything. Just expected there to be good weather. And then it got to where we didn't even think about it. And it wasn't even a matter of expecting it. It's just part of what we expect God to do overall. It's not even a, it's not even a clear, conscious expectation. It's, it's just an assumption that, of course, it'll be this way. And see, that's, that's faith. faith. That's the way faith grows. Now, I don't know if y'all checked earlier this year or earlier this week. It's supposed to have been raining from... Thursday on. Isn't that right? I was just thinking of that. Do I? I was just thinking of that. Yep. And, and that was the first thing when I started going this trip. My wife got on, checked the weather. She goes, she just started laughing and said, you know, it's supposed to be raining the whole week you're there. And I said, yeah. It usually is. Usually supposed. That's why I said usually supposed to be. Okay. And then I heard about the cold front coming in. And, you know, a lot of times when cold front and heat gets together, there's rain. I, I thought... I could put up with a cold. I, I brought some cold because I thought it might be cold actually or cooler. So I brought some cold weather clothes. So I got this long overcoat like thing and I'm, yeah, I was ready to wear all that stuff. I'm like, cause I like it, but I don't really like, I don't like cold weather. You know what I mean? Icy, snow, I don't like that. But you know, if it gets down 45, 50 degrees, I know that's not really cold. I know that. But for Texas boy, it's cold. <laughs> okay, so, because I, I used to have a friend that came from New York and when it was, 35, he'd be wearing shorts and flip-flops, you know, and I'm like, you're crazy, you need, you need prayer, you know, so, <laughs> so, but the reason I'm saying all this, I'm not just rambling here, the reason I'm saying this is because we don't have one example of Jesus ever commanding judgment on a person and them dying or having sickness or anything like that, but he said that God gave him the authority to execute judgment. Now, however, now this, 
I'm not just trying to mess you up, okay? But I do try to get you to think and to go into the Bible and look. When Paul was going through the cities and he had his team with him, there was a woman that was demon-possessed that kept following them around and kept saying... Now, the thing was, she was demon-possessed, but she wasn't saying anything wrong. She was saying the truth. And she was just saying, these are the men of God come to show us a way of salvation. Right? But it's never good to have a devil advertise your meetings. All right? Now, <clears throat> it said after many days, Paul being grieved in his spirit, he turned around and cast the devil out of her. Right? And funny thing is, the next thing you read is they're in jail. Right? Right after that, they go to jail. Now, the reason I say that is because it didn't say the Spirit of God led Paul to do that. You understand? It didn't say he led him. It says Paul being grieved, not in the Spirit, in his Spirit. Essentially what happened was Paul got fed up. That's what it means to be grieved in your spirit. Now, I'm not saying grie he did. the Holy Spirit wasn't grieved. Paul wasn't feeling the grieving of the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Paul was grieved in his spirit. If you ever get a, a, a good handle or a good idea of the position of authority God has put you in, you are not mere normal humans like everybody else that's just trying to make it through this world. That's not you. That's why I told you yesterday, when you come into church, most of the time the problem is you come in and the attitude of the church you come into gets on you. And the attitude of most churches is we're just keeping the doors open, we're doing our job, we're preaching, we're getting people saved, but the way it is is the way it's been and the way it's been is the way it's going to be. Now, they talk about better days, they talk about a revival, but usually when they talk about revival it's a small outburst uh, matter of fact, on the way over, I saw a church that said revival. And it had, like, you know, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. You know, so we're going to come alive for three days, and we're going to die again. <laughs> you can't plan a revival like that. You understand? And I'm not, you, told me, you heard me yesterday talk about revivals and things. <clears throat> Christians shouldn't need reviving. And if you ever get a hold of what God has given you and what he's provided for you, you when you get a hold of that, you come alive, and you'll never, need to, you'll never die again. Because it stays the same. That stuff is too good. You know, the Bible, it is amazing how good it is. Matter of fact, it's, it is beyond human comprehension of what God has done through Jesus for us. Right? It, and it's not just fire insurance. And it's not just healing. And it's not just these blessings. It is who he made us. That's the key. See, <clears throat> that's what Dr. Lake used to say. He said that the secret of Christianity is not in becoming. It's in the being. The problem is, all Christians are always trying to become and never just being. Now, <clears throat> I might have mentioned this to you yesterday. I, I think I might have mentioned some anyway. Our problem is, we try to come to church every Sunday for years on end and thinking that we're going to eventually evolve into the Christian that God wants us to be. And instead, God is not a God of evolution. He's a God of creation. We are new creations. He made you what He wanted you to be. You're already that. Right? You were made perfect and complete in Him. Now, when, now, understand, when a baby is born, first thing you do is you start counting fingers and toes. Right? You want to make sure the baby's all there. Right? And if something's missing, you know there's a problem. Right? But you know what's supposed to be there. And, and now, the baby's a baby. They're not grown. But when you count all the fingers and toes and everything's there, you can say, oh, good, they're complete. Isn't that right? But they're not grown. But they're complete. They're born complete. Right? A baby's never going to have more fingers than they're born with. You understand? I mean, don't get super spiritual with me. And Well, if they're born with that one, we can pray. And I don't even go there. Right? If, if you fully believe that and we're walking in it, you wouldn't be here. Okay? So... The idea, what I'm trying to get across to you is when you got born again, God did his job well. Right? He doesn't need to complete you. When you were born again, you were a new creation. You were completed. You were born complete. Now, you still had to grow. But you were born complete. That means nothing else is going to be added to you. A child doesn't need anything added to him. 
he has to learn to walk in who he is. Right? And as he learns to walk in that, that's called maturity. So, you know, they, they grow and, and they do learn some things, but they don't, they have nothing added to them. They're not going to have extra arms or any of that kind of stuff. They learn to use what they were born with. Amen? And you can see that, especially when they start walking. They're trying to get those legs to work together, you know, in unison. <laughs> and they're trying to learn to balance, and they're doing all that stuff. They, they're not having things added to them. They're learning to walk in who they are. They're learning to use what they were given. Well, when you were born again, you were born complete. You cannot find any scripture that says anything about adding something to you. Now, the closest you can come is when Peter said, add to your faith virtue, add to that kind of stuff. But it has nothing to do with, it, said, it tells you to add it. You understand? It doesn't say God's going to add it to you. And the way you add it is you take these precious promises in the Bible and you start to live them. All right? Now, the reason I say that is because I've got to get you beyond the point of you always waiting until God gives you something. The bad part is, when you got born again, you were complete. But you didn't know, and, and you know something happened, but you call it get, getting born again. You go, I was born again, or oh, it was great, it was wonderful. Yeah, it was a great experience. And then you come in, and then you hear the church tell you, but you need this, and you got to do this, and you got to have this, and you got to do this. And you're thinking, okay, how did I get that? Well, you sit and wait. You know, or you pray and pray and pray and pray until he dumps it on you or something. And you don't realize that what you're waiting on has already happened. The problem was you just didn't know you got it when you got it. You know, it's like I said today, when you buy those CDs and you, you'll buy a program and then it'll tell you, okay, here's what you bought. And you go, wait a minute, it says that this application's on there and there's 10 more things on there. Yeah, but you didn't pay for those. You pay for this. And you have to call the headquarters and pay for the other things and they'll give you the key that unlocks it. All right? Well, the good thing is, Jesus has already paid for everything. But you got things in you that literally are locked, not locked away from you, just unused, and you don't know they're there. If you don't know they're there, I have gone and bought stuff. And my family laughs at me a lot of times because I bought stuff. And then when I come home, my wife says, you, you know you got one of those. I'm like, no, if I did, I wouldn't have bought it. She goes, well, it's right over here in this. Well, why didn't you ask me? Because it's right here. I'm talking, well, I hadn't seen it in six months, so I, you know, just forgot and rebought it. She goes, well, save this receipt. And what it is, she, I save the receipt, she takes it back, and she keeps the money, and she gets back on it. I've, I've learned. So. <laughs> so, but, but I didn't know I already had it. And if you don't know, you say, I don't go looking for it because I didn't know I had it. And if you don't know you have it, you won't go looking for it. And so then people tell you, well, oh, you don't have it. You've got to have it added to you. You don't have to have anything added to you. You are perfect and complete in Him. And you can't get around that. That's Scripture, right? So if you're complete in Him, then you don't need anything added. What you need to do is have things released by peeling off the layers, right? And, but before you can really release it, you have to know you have it. So or you won't even look toward it, all right? Or you'll always be looking out there trying to get it some other way. And you cannot get anything from God any other way than through Jesus. You understand? It's not all this. When Paul said, I want to come and impart some spiritual gift to you. He was not talking about gifts of the Spirit. He was talking about a spiritual gift. See, what I've been giving you the last three days is a spiritual gift. It's, it's, a, it's a gift from God through me to you of understanding who you are. That's a spiritual gift. Knowledge, understanding, that's a spiritual gift. It's not a gift of the Spirit. You understand the difference? Gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12. When Paul said, I want to come impart a spiritual gift to you, he wasn't talking about laying hands on them and giving them, and saying, okay, boom, now you got it. It, it wasn't like that necessarily. Now, you know, he said, I know this is in you. I know, because I put my hands on you. I know I, there has been prophecies that have, he said, war, a good warfare with the prophecies that have gone before. In other words, there have been words spoken into you that brought these things alive in you, and you're supposed to war a warfare with that. Right? Many times people have prophecies, and they just sit and wait for them to happen. That's not what you do. You get a prophecy, you go to God and say, Father, you said that this, this would happen, that this would take place. I'm ready for it. Bring it to pass. I'm ready. We're ready to do it. Let's do it. And you, you pray those things into existence. You don't just sit and wait for them to happen. Right? Jesus went and healed the sick that it might be fulfilled. Right? If he had just sat in the house, it wouldn't have been fulfilled. He had to go out and do it. 
right? Now, <clears throat> I said that because, now, go with me, too. We're going to kind of go through Scripture a lot today, as we have been doing all along. And we're going to go to <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1. And I'm just going to give you some scriptures that you need a new paradigm. Right? You need a new way of thinking about things. You need to think out of the old box that you've been in. You need to think in terms... And, and the new paradigm you need is a biblical paradigm instead of an Augustinian paradigm. The Augustinian paradigm was formed by, of course, by Augustine. And he was the one that came out with stained glass windows. And said, look, we can see the majesty of God through the light going to the stained glass. And he represents this. And he, started, he was the one that said, oh, God's got a secret will. And we don't always know God's will. Well, the Bible says, don't be foolish, but wise, knowing the will of God. So we can know the will of God. And if you don't know the will of God, the Bible says you are foolish and unwise. Right? And Augustine said, oh, God's got a secret will. That's why when, when people are born crippled... That's God's secret will. About 90% of all the wrong doctrine came from Augustine. Right? You go back in and study what he taught, and it's amazing. Because he kept coming up with you know, this hidden will of God, and, and don't worry about what, you know, this is God's will that you're suffering. And, and here's why. The, the funny thing was, in the early days of the church, see, today, whenever we have trouble, we think uh, that, oh, you know, what did I do wrong? And you go back and study the early days of the church, they expected trouble. They expected persecution. They expected the devil to come after them. Because they understood above everything else, this is warfare between two kingdoms. And if you're going to be in one kingdom, the other kingdom is going to hate you. And you have to decide that you're going to stand against that other kingdom. It's, it is it's so simple. Everything we read about in the Bible, you realize Jesus had an adversary. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. You understand? The devil is an enemy. The devil is, he's the adversary. He's, he's not a friend of God. He's not a helper of God. He's not trying to bring God's will to pass in your life. Right? The, the devil is not God's tool to try to get you to be a better person or try to teach you anything. And sickness and disease came from the devil. John 10.10. 10, anything that kills, steals, or destroys is of the devil. Now, and matter of fact, we were talking about this last night. The scripture does not say that God, that Jesus came to give you abundant life. It does not say that. That is a perversion of scripture that is totally prevalent in the church today. It, he did not say, I've come to give you abundant life. He said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. Amen? There is a difference between abundant life and life abundant. An abundant life means you have houses, cars, money, everything you need, blessings, uh, what we would call blessings, all this stuff. But a drug dealer can have an abundant life. They got things, they got cars, they got money, they got air, all that kind of stuff. They've got an abundant life, but they do not have life abundant. Because no drug dealer can lay his hands on the sick and has enough life for himself and enough to give away to somebody else to get them well. That's life abundant. See, life abundant means I got enough to keep me well, and I got enough, I got so much extra life that I got more than I need, and I can give you the life I have left over that I don't even need. You understand? That's life abundant. So this this <clears throat> this abundant life teaching that's in the church only works really here in America and in developed countries. Right? It's an American gospel, it is not the gospel. It's, a, it's an American gospel. And what it is, is we have turned the American dream into the gospel. And it, that is not it. Alright? So, <clears throat> hopefully by now you found Genesis 126. Okay? If you haven't, you ain't gonna, so <laughs> look on with somebody else. Genesis 126. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air over the cattle and over all the earth and watch and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him 
male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now go back to, uh, first off, go back to 28, top of 28. God blessed them, God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Now, that is the law of Genesis. That everything reproduces after its own kind, and everything is to multiply and be fruitful. Being, now notice it says, be fruitful, multiply. Multiplying is being fruitful. Okay? That's the way it works. And replenish the earth. Now, he says, have dominion over the earth. And, and even the word dominion means to take authority, to exercise authority, to guard, to uh, oversee. And see where people get upset. You remember when Jesus said, <clears throat> he was, they were taught, the Pharisees came to him and he actually said, um, you know, it says in the scriptures, I said, ye are gods to whom the scriptures came. And see, everybody gets all bent out of shape over that. Oh, you see, is it? but he did say that, right? But it's because when people read the word God, they think God it, instead of what he meant. Adam was an under ruler for God, right? He was an overseer. The word God, if you look up the word God, even in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament uh, dictionary or lexicon, the word God means, it can mean God, but the way that it's used can also mean a magistrate. You know, what is a magistrate? A judge, right? It's someone who is placed in authority to oversee something and to give judgments. Well, that's what Jesus was saying in John 5 that I mentioned to you a while ago. You notice it said, He has given the authority to execute judgments to Jesus because He was the Son of Man. It means He was a man. Man, do you realize, not... Okay, when, when God made the earth, put man here, He gave man dominion over all the earth. Isn't that right? He said, oversee the earth. Rule it. Keep it. Subdue it. Make it obey you. Keep things out of it. So he was an overseer. At, at the time that Adam was created, there was no being on earth higher than him. You understand? The, the only being higher than Adam was God. Simple as that. You go in, you read Psalms, it talks about, for a little while I made you lower than the angels. That's really a bad translation. It says, for a little while you were made lower than Elohim. Right? Which means God. Now, you are not made lower than the angels. The Bible says you're going to judge angels. Matter of fact, the Bible says you're going to judge the earth. That's what it says. Then later it says Jesus is going to judge the earth. Well, how is Jesus going to judge it? Through the magistrates he has put in place. Through you, you're going to judge it. And it will be his judgment because you're operating in, as his representative. Well, part of that judgment, the position of authority you're going to be placed in when he returns is based on how well you oversee and fulfill your obligations now. He said, when I return, if you've been faithful over one city, I'll put you over five. Isn't that right? And so, if you're not faithful over one city, see, when he returns, your, your time of shining stops. Right? Now, the reason I say that is because when he returns, he says, I'm coming with my reward in my hand for you. So, at the time he comes back, all vying for position stops. Okay, it's like divine musical chairs, right? Right now the music's playing. You get to do some things. We, there's no need to cast out devils in heaven. Amen? No sick to be healed in heaven. So if you're going to do it, you've got to do it now. Right? And well, you know, I, I'm waiting. You, you can't wait. Number one, the people are dying. Number two, you don't know how long you have. You know, and I'm not talking about you just dying. I'm talking about you don't know when he's coming back. Isn't that right? And so you need to get busy now. I passed by Seventh Day Adventist Church the other day near where I live, and they had a sign up that says, Jesus is coming. Look busy. I know it'd be it'd be really funny if it wasn't so sad. And but in other words, when I was managing restaurant, one of the things that I noticed is that every morning when I opened the door, 
because there'd be some other people there sometimes earlier. When I opened the door and they knew it was me, all of a sudden I heard this rush of movement. Get busy. Oh, he's here. I'm sweeping. We don't want to be that way. And you don't want to wait till five minutes before Jesus shows up to go, you know what? I'm going to go heal the sick. Right? Now's the time. Now's the time to get busy. And you say, well, who, who should I heal? If they're sick, get after it. Amen? Jesus paid for all of them. Nobody should bear it. You just keep driving it out and keep working it. But, but you're going to have to decide that you believe the Word of God where it gives you authority. Now, do you realize in this verse, in Genesis 1, verse 26 through 28, God gave, at that time, I don't know what word to use, really, but the best I can say is natural man. He wasn't a Christian. You understand? It was natural man. Now, if Satan hadn't got in there, then this natural man would have reproduced and he would have told his children, now our job here, according to God, is to subdue the earth, replenish it, and have dominion over it. And over a period of time, his children, now I'm taking Satan out of the picture, and his children would have multiplied to the point where all over the earth, his children would have been having dominion. And they would still be here because they wouldn't have died. Right? See, that's one of the things that... <clears throat> it, it's funny because people say, well, you know, dinosaurs, uh, did, you know, they existed millions of years ago before man. Okay, that's impossible. Because the Bible says that death entered through the sin of Adam. If they were here millions of years before man, they, they were still living until Adam sinned. Because nothing died on the earth until Adam sinned. You understand? That's how... Down there by my house, they can, they have dinosaur prints and human prints in the same place. Why? Because dinosaurs and men walk side by side. They were around, right? Because nothing died until Adam sinned. You understand? Now, and there would have been multiplication, and there would have been dominion, and they would have overseen things and kept it, and they would have made it stay the same. Now, that is God's plan. That was God's original plan. Satan didn't mess that up. Now, let me say it this way. Satan didn't change God's plan, right? He may have put a kind of a parenthesis in there for a bit, but God didn't change his mind. You know, God didn't say, okay, have dominion. Then Satan comes in and goes, okay, forget it. No, you're nothing now. He didn't do that. God's plan all along. You can see it throughout history. God's plan was for man to have dominion. And you, you even look, it is in the heart of man to have dominion. Every war... It is amazing. Right here now, it, God tells Adam, have dominion over the whole earth. Right? Over everything that creeps upon the earth. The fish. and the, He names everything but other men. Right? And yet, every war starts because some man basically wants to ex exert dominion over another man. And it's in the heart of men to exercise dominion. That's why you see a mountain, somebody has to climb it. Why? Because it's there. Why? There's no reason for it. But I've got to climb it because I have to defeat it. I have to overcome it. I have to have dominion over it. Right? Now, of course, if you were like Adam, you could just basically say, I want to be there, and you, you could be there. Right? That's how things work in the spirit realm. That's how Elijah got around. Okay? Yeah, I don't know if you know it or not. That, the first time Elijah kind of disappeared and took off, that wasn't the first time it happened. Right? Because all the other sons of the prophets and all the other people said they all knew it was happening. And they all, matter of fact, they went looking for him. They were apparently used to him doing that kind of stuff. You know, being one, one place here and then, you know, disappearing and being over here and they have to go looking for him. Because remember, whenever he, when he disappeared, they went looking for him. Because they were used to him disappearing. It wasn't the first time it happened. But see, we look at these things and we automatically say, well, this must be that. I mean, because if it's the first time it's happened, they'd say, well, he just went off somewhere and that's that. But they knew. And the, the sons of the prophets even knew that God was going to take Elijah that day. And they told him, don't you know? They told Elisha, don't you know? God's going to take your master today? They said, oh. so they knew when it was going to happen. And you, you know the story of the double portion, you know, he wanted it, which doesn't apply to you. Okay? Nothing in the New Testament about you having a double portion. Right? You don't need a double portion. The reason they had a portion is because they didn't have the fullness. 
You don't need a double portion. You have a fullness. You don't have a piece of what Jesus had. You got Jesus. Right? I, I, I wouldn't want Ross Perot to write me a check. I'd much rather have Ross Perot go with me on the road and see what I do. Right? Because if he saw what I do, guess what? I'd have a bigger check than what he gave me. If he just wrote me a check, he'd write a check. But if he went with me, he'd say, you know what? What you're doing is a good thing. I'm going to get behind you and let's just go and do this. And I'd have whatever I needed. Right? That's, why would I want a portion? It's, it's amazing. As Christians, we settle for something that Old Testament saint had. Instead of walking in what Jesus had. And I'll show you that in just a minute, as a matter of fact. It says, <clears throat> but throughout history, man has had dominion and wanted dominion. And even, the extra, even us going to the moon, that's an exercise of man, in the spirit of man, knowing we're supposed to have dominion. And to overcome and to accomplish and to do these things. And, and everything we've done on this earth. And, you know, we have beaten pretty much every aspect of the earth. You know, we, we have beaten the, the actual earth itself. We have cars, we have roads, we've, we've beaten it. But because man fell from his position, we've had to do it from natural means. Right? We, we've beaten the air by airplanes. You know, it is an amazing thing if you just ever stop and think about airplanes. Okay? That thing weighs hundreds of thousands of pounds and yet it flies through the air. And you look at it and you think, it? I'll never forget the first time I had a pilot come over the, over the speaker and tell us, you know, well, we appreciate you flying with us. The next time you want to fly 600 miles an hour through the air in a small metal tube that was built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> we hope you think of us. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I'm sure glad he didn't say that at the beginning of the flight. <laughs> you know? Because that's what they're all built by the lowest bidder, okay? <laughs> so, but we've defeated the air. You understand? We've defeated the ocean. We've overcome. We have dominion over the ocean. Not only do we sail on top of it, we go under it in submarines. You know, we've went some of the deepest depths. And, but it's man doing it through natural means. But it's that spirit of dominion in him that pushes him to that. All right? Now, because... Because he is natural, there are only two minds on this earth, right? There's the mind of Christ and the mind of the devil, okay? There's no human mind separate from one of those. Every mind either thinks like God or thinks like the devil, you understand? Or somewhere on the scale in between. Now, remember when Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, they're going to kill me and all this. And Peter says, oh no, well, we're not going to let that happen. And Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. Remember that? Well, he said, get behind me, Satan. We think sometimes, well, he, was, was Peter demon-possessed all of a sudden? No. You look at the word Satan, it means adversary. He was saying simply, get behind me, adversary. You're, you're against me, you're against what I'm doing. But Peter was only thinking of keeping him alive. But if you read the next part, Jesus told him why he called him an adversary. He said, because you don't savor, you don't think on, you don't desire the things of, the, of God, but the things of man. Now, he called him Satan because he thought like a man. Why? Because the mind of a natural man is the mind of Satan. Simple as that. And the mind of a Christian is supposed to be the mind of God, the mind of Christ. So there's only two minds, the mind of God, the mind of the devil. And you're somewhere on the scale between the two. And the more you have your mind renewed to the word of God, the more your mind becomes like the mind of God, and the more you can think the thoughts of God. Well, yeah, but his thoughts are above our thoughts. And his, no, I already told you, if his thoughts are above your thoughts and his ways above your ways, you need to get saved. Right? Isn't that simple? He said, well, I just don't think we can think the thoughts of God. Then don't read his word. Don't read the Bible. That's his thoughts. Isn't that right? That was his thoughts. And he even said in Jeremiah, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts of good, not thoughts of evil. Isn't that right? He said, that, why didn't, see, it's funny because everybody that quotes the Old Testament quotes all the death stuff. They never quote the parts about, I know the thoughts I have towards you, good thoughts of good, not of evil. 
All these things. They always go back into, well, you know, I created the waster to destroy. I created the blind. I created, all that kind of stuff. What? And people read that, and if you go back and look at it in the Hebrew, it's very simple. Number one, it, I can't say it's in the permissive tense per se, but what he's saying, all he's doing is saying, it's like a parent. If you have a parent, if you're a parent and you have a child, and that child walks over and picks up a rock and throws it through a window, guess who's going to pay for the window? Not the child, you. Why? Because you're responsible for that child until they get mature enough to act on their own. Isn't that right? That's all God was saying. Look, I take responsibility that the blind were born blind. I take responsibility. Why? Because I started this whole thing. I didn't make him blind. I didn't create the blindness. But I started this world and then Satan got in and which caused this man to be blind. So I take responsibility and don't worry, I'm going to do something about it. And he did. He sent his word, Jesus, and healed them. And then people want to sit back and go, well, when's he going to do something? See, it was his fault. He did. Yes. Keep thinking that way. Stay blind. You know, stay dying and stay not helping anybody. And see, people that, people that think that way never do anything. They never help anybody. And so, but when you start realizing God has done everything he can do to fix things. And the problem is not God's fault, it's our fault. He said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You've got to do something about it. See, that's, that's the whole point. And then you look at Jesus. Do you realize, as we said the other day, Jesus sent out his disciples. They healed the sick. They weren't born again. They didn't have the Spirit of God upon them. You understand? They operated strictly by the authority of Jesus saying, go do it. You say, well, how, how did the sick get healed? Or how, well, you know, without it being the Spirit of God. I didn't say the Spirit of God didn't do it. But there's a difference between the Spirit of God being in you, being on you, or not, or, or actually doing the work and having nothing to do with you. There are people that can preach the Word and do different things and miracles happen and it not have anything to do with the Spirit being on that person. It has to do with the people hearing and going, okay, and believing and grabbing it. You, you understand what I'm saying? You are in a position of dominion, but, and again, I've got to <clears throat> get you into the Scripture to prove it, but... Here's, here's the thing you have to understand. Many people are taught, well, we have um, uh, delegated authority. Jesus delegated authority in Matthew 28. He said, in my, you know, I've been given all power and authority in heaven and earth. So, or, yeah. And so you go in my name. So well, he delegated authority to us to go do this in his name. All right. That was true. That was to the disciples. It is to you also. But the disciples he spoke that to wasn't necessarily the disciples that are in the book of Acts. All right? When he spoke that, they had not received the Spirit as of Acts 2.4. You understand what I'm saying? They're coming upon you. They were natural people that were unborn again at that point. Most of them didn't even understand what it meant to, to believe in his sacrifice. A lot of that came through Paul's revelation. Understanding what took place. Oh, okay, I died with him. I understand. Because they didn't understand a lot of things like that. But it did say that he took those 40 days from his, from his resurrection until his ascension. And, he, and it, the amazing thing is this. And he taught them everything out of the scriptures concerning the kingdom of God. That's what they were doing. They were operating in the kingdom of God. Now, you are in the kingdom of God. If you're born again, if, if you're... If you're born again, put it that way, you're in the kingdom of God. As I told you earlier, Dr. Lake had greater healings before his baptism in the Spirit than most people have afterwards. Right? People say, well, well, you can't heal the sick until you get baptized in the Spirit. That is not true. Dowie healed the sick, did not have the baptism in the Spirit. I can take you through history, 2,000 years of history, and show you healings, deliverances, and everything from people that had, that had not received what we call the baptism in the Spirit. He said, then, then what is the purpose of that? Well, the difference is, when you get born again, see, John 1.12 says, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become, or authority, to become the sons of God. When you get born again, as a son of God, you have authority. Just because you're born again, you have authority. He said, then what do we need the baptism of the Spirit for? Well, we need the Spirit to come upon us. The baptism of the Spirit gives you the ability to act like a son anytime, anywhere, in any circumstance. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, you have authority. Most people operate by faith. You say, isn't that a good thing? Y yeah, it is. 
But I'm saying you're operating by faith, not by position. Right? Now, we have to walk in faith. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we, faith has to be there. But most people never walk by authority. They just walk by faith. And faith is, okay, I believe God's going to do it. Okay, I believe God wants them healed, so I believe God's going to do it. So I have faith that God's going to do it. That's where they walk. And they get some results, but nobody that walks that way ever ends up looking like Jesus. All right? They always end up looking like some beggar child trying to get God to do something. But when you start to walk in your position as a son of God, and you walk in a position of authority, you start to look and talk and act like Jesus, and all of a sudden the results change. The results get greater, they get more consistent. That's what you're going to have to do. You're, and, and again, well, we're going to get there next session. <laughs> we're going to get in there. But I'm going to show you from the scriptures, and I'm going to prove it to you. But I want to take you back to Genesis 1 first to say, look, if you want to know where you're going, first you have to go back to the architect's blueprints and find out what the original plan was. Right? Because if you don't have the original plan, you, you never know exactly where you're going and any thing anybody throws up at you, you'll go, okay, that's, yeah, that sounds good, because you don't know what the original plan was. The original plan of God was for man to have dominion over the earth. All right? Then Adam bowed his knee to Satan. The minute he did, everything under Adam. See, you notice Satan didn't go to the animals and try to get them to all bow to him. Why? Because that wouldn't have been the top of the heap. Right? That wouldn't have been the top of creation. Yeah, okay. So what if you get the cattle to bow to you? Adam was over the cattle. You understand? Technically, the cattle couldn't change kings. Why? Because they had a king over them that had authority over them. You understand? And because of that, for the cattle to change kingdoms the king over them would have to change kingdoms. If the cattle had just changed, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I'm just trying to give you, I could use another animal if you want me to. But for the, for the cattle to change kings without their king, Adam, changing kings, they would have been starting an insurrection. You understand? And Adam would have done what? He would have subdued. See, sub, subdue means to bring under control. So if the animals had caused an uprising and said, we're going to go serve Satan. Adam would have said, no, you're not. He would have subdued them. You understand? I know this sounds ridiculous. I'm, but I'm trying to think. You know, a lot of things in the Bible sound ridiculous. Okay? You know, a serpent talking to Eve and her not being surprised. Sounds kind of ridiculous. Right? But there are several other cases of animals speaking. Balaam's donkey spoke. Right? Which didn't surprise Balaam. Isn't that right? Didn't really surprise him that much. Now, so when Adam, that's why Satan went to Adam. Adam was the highest person on this earth. So whenever Satan knew, if I want the earth, I got to get the king of the earth to bow its, his knee to me. And if he does, then I'll have the earth. And not only will I have the earth, but I'll have everything under Adam. See, if he hadn't... A, got Adam to change, he would have just got a few things. But when he got Adam, he got everything. What, that's the whole point. God's plan didn't change because a situation. Right? Remember whenever Moses was taken, to, God told Moses, take the children of Israel into the promised land. You think God didn't know Moses was going to die before he took them there? Think that surprised God? But he told them, take them there. In other words, God told Moses his plan. My plan doesn't have to do with a man. It has to do with a people. My plan is to get the people of God into the promised land. Right? It wasn't a plan with Moses because he knew Moses wasn't ever going to make it. So it wasn't about a man. It was about a people. So when Moses died, what did he tell Joshua? Joshua, Get the people into the promised land. You notice God's plan didn't change because a man died or because leadership changed? God's plan is settled. He knows his plan. So that proves that God's plan was for a people and not a man. Right? Or he would have said, hey, Joshua, I'm glad you're here now. Matter of fact, we're going to do something different. Turn around, let's go this way. 
But it, see, everybody said, I'm trying to find my place. I'm trying to find my position in the body. I'm trying to find my role in the body of Christ. I'm, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to find my purpose. Okay? It's real simple. Find God's plan. Get in on God's plan. Do His plan. If you do His plan, you have found your purpose. Your purpose is to fulfill the plan of God. You understand? All this stuff about this individual thing. Well, what's my gifts? Well, what's my calling? You know, well, I'm, call I'm trying to find my calling. Get do you know what I... I've had people come to me and say, you know, Brother Kirk, can you tell me what I'm supposed to be? You know, am I supposed to be an apostle? Am I supposed to be a prophet? And I always tell them what I told you yesterday, what Dr. Summerall said. Well, you know, let me follow you around a little while and I can tell you what you are. You know, and if you don't do nothing, that's what you are. A do nothing. All right? See, we think everything is set in a certain way and it has to be. See, because God knows how things are going to be, doesn't mean He's dictated them to be that way. You understand? Just because he knows the outcome doesn't mean that he said, this is what I want the outcome to be. Because if that's true, everybody's going to hell and it's God's plan for them to go to hell. And yet we know the Bible says it is not God's plan. It is not his ideal. It is not his, his goal that anyone should die, that anyone should perish. But his plan is that everybody should come to know Jesus Christ. Isn't it right? But is everybody knowing, coming to know Jesus Christ? No then His will is not always done automatically. Right? If His will was always done automatically, He wouldn't tell you, pray, Thy will be done. You don't need to pray for something that's going to happen anyway. Right? When Daniel wrote, he said, he, he went in and he said, he looked and by reason of understanding the books, he saw that the time of the prophecy had come to fulfillment and he set himself to praying. And that's when freedom came. You understand? He had to do something. Now, God's will was that it come to pass. But he had to find God's will and then he had to pray it into being and he had to bring it to pass. Or it wouldn't have happened. Or God would have found somebody else to do it. One of the two. Amen? Do you understand that? See, you need to get this Augustinian thinking out of your head. Augustinian was wrong. Right? Matter of fact, I'll tell you what. I don't suggest a lot of books. But if anybody gets a chance, if you can find it, you may have to order it because it's hard to find but there is a book called God at War by a man named Gregory Boyd. Gregory Boyd, B-O-Y-D. One of the best books I've ever read. It is highly uh, academic and very scholarly. It's well documented and you're not going to sit down and just read through it. Right? You're going to take your time and have to sort it out. But overall, if you get that, you will understand this kingdom warfare, warfare stuff because I, I, I had a, an overall idea of warfare from the Bible. But after I read that, it's like it put it all into perspective. It is amazing. Jesus talks several times about binding the strong man. And you can't, you can't spoil his house until you bind him. Everything Jesus talked about was warfare. Two kings don't go to war. A king doesn't go to war with another king unless he is sure that he can defeat that king with a smaller army. That's a, everything in there is about warfare. And so all these things that Jesus used, so once you, and, and this, this book brings all that. So if you get a chance, get that and read it sometime. It's going to cost you, you know, 20, 30 bucks. But it's a good book, right? And he actually has a second book called The Problem, with the, uh, the Problem of, of Evil. And that one goes into this Augustinian viewpoint of what happened, why, and that kind of, it's, it's some of the best I've ever read as far as explaining it in a level that you can really understand it. And our problem is we, we try to figure out how to cope with evil. You know, well, I got, I got sickness, I got cancer, I got this, this tragedy in my life, and I'm trying to cope with it. Because, you know, God won't put anything on us that we can't bear. No, but the devil will. Right? And just because you have a problem. See, we have a natural human uh, defense mechanism that when anything gets too bad for us to handle, automatically we have built in us this religious gene that automatically says, oh, I can't bear this. This must be God. 
Because if we can put it on God, then we can say, and God must have some secret plan. There's some good that's got to come out of this because we surely can't believe that this thing so bad could actually happen to us for no reason. So we have to have a reason, and the reason is this hidden will of God. Right? Now, let me tell you something. I, can give, I could stand up here and give you some atrocities that were committed by the Nazis in World War II. And I guarantee you, God did not have a plan some secret will that was being carried out in Nazi POWs in their lives. You understand? That, but yet even they would go through that same process mentally of saying this must be the will of God. And it wasn't the will of God that things like that happened to people. And Jesus even said that. He said, when they came to him and said, told him about all these things and he said, the people who perished when the, when the tower fell on them, were they any more evil than anybody else? In other words, people are saying, oh, that must have been because they were sinners. This, this tower fell and killed them because they were sinners. And he said, were they any greater sinners than anybody else? And he said, but nevertheless, you also will die in your sins if you don't repent. You see? And, and he would use a... He said, look, the Father causes the sun to shine... On the just and the unjust. You understand? He said, look, bad things happen in this world. It doesn't mean God did them. If God does things, he makes the sun to shine on the just. In other words, he treats the just and the unjust the same. Which means he doesn't bring judgment on them and do these. And, oh, God's doing this and, you know, he's bringing this thing on you. He's, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, if God is going to use cancer to teach you something then if, if I don't get cancer to teach me that same thing, then God loved you more than he did me. You, you understand what I'm saying? That means that if God tries to... If, if, I've had people say, I would be praying for them or something, they say, well, you know, uh, God ain't going to heal my legs because I used to love to dance, and he knows if I got healed, I'd go back dancing again. So God ain't going to heal me. I'm like, so what you're telling me is, God is keeping you holy... By keeping you crippled. So then why isn't everybody else in the dance hall crippled? God loves you more than he does them? No, God's not a respecter of persons. He loves all men equally. Isn't that right? So if he's going to do that to you, he better do it to the others or he's going to be guilty of partiality. See, most of this religious thinking is easily destroyed if you just think it through. Just... and. But that's why the Pharisees didn't get it. They let religious thinking block the, the common sense that the farmers and the fishermen that listened to Jesus had. Because they understood it. See, religious thinking will blind you. And it will stop you from receiving what God has for you. Amen? Do you understand this? Alright, I know I get you all excited now. So, <laughs> let's go ahead and take a break. Okay? <clears throat> take a break. <laughs>